I am very pleased and privileged to have the opportunity to chat with a man whom I've actually never met. Ken Weinstein, president and co-founder of Big Hassle Media, one of the most important boutique publicity and marketing firms in the music industry. So Ken, thank, welcome to Thank Sync you, Up. kind words. Thank you. Well, you guys are huge. Uh, as far as um, an independent publicity company, I mean, I think for people in the music industry, certainly for music critics, um, they, they, everybody knows who you are. And there's, um, I used to be a music critic, yes. and uh, there were only a couple that you, you knew, that, what were pretty, what was the other one? Uh, I've forgotten the names of all these companies. Uh, there's many, uh, Nasty Little Man, Nasty, Girly that's Action. That's the one I'm thinking of, Nasty Little Shorefire. Man. Surefire. Well, Surefire Press is, here. is, we've actually had folks from Surefire oh, cool. here. Yeah. Um, but there, there's only a handful that everybody knows as being like, uh, kind of like what we were talking about with Frank Riley, the booking agency, uh, the booking agent yesterday, integrity, and uh, known for not just going for the money, not just taking whoever it is to to grab that quick check, but but truly knowing music, believing in music, and taking on clients that you believe in, and. So then when you speak about them, people w are willing to listen because they know that it's coming from somebody serious. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for saying so. Um, it certainly was a goal from the beginning. Um, I was uh, lucky enough at, to work at some great labels for 10 years in the 90s and then, um, frankly, lucky enough to get laid off from one of them. Um, and uh, when we started Big Hassle in uh, 1999 with my partner Jim Merlis, um, he was at uh, Geffen, and I was at Mercury at the time, and we, wanted, we took a lot of what we learned at the majors um, and the independent labels that we were at, and you know, we, we wanted to make our, our, our company as eclectic as our record collection, and wanted to only work with things that we believed in, um, and we felt that with passion, uh, you know, the money would flow from there. Um. Let's talk about, um, let's go back to the beginning. Let's just find out a little bit about you personally. So there's an old saying, uh, I used to be a music critic, and um, there's an old saying with music critics that those who can't do, review. And so that's... Some, a, some Woody Allen thing there. Yeah, and so the, the idea being that if you can't make it as a musician, you go into being a music critic because then you can, you know, get your rocks off by telling everybody else how much they suck. Um, you actually did it the other way. You started out as a music critic, and then became a, a professional musician and a quite successful one at that. Tell us about that. Well, I wouldn't say I became a professional musician. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I became a professional amateur musician. Um, well, I did start out, I mean, for me, publicity is sort of an accident. I stumbled into it. Um, I did not, uh, I just want, the, the music fandom came first, so. Um, had a brother who was five years older than me, turned me into a music fanatic, and I, as soon as I had my newspaper route and was making money, I was buying records. Um, and, uh, and were you playing music as a kid? And, you know, well, I was in the band, you know, I was in orchestra. I was, uh, I, you know, played French horn. <laughs> I was the littlest kid in the school, and I wanted to play trumpet, which was manageable. And uh, the teacher said, we have too many trumpet players, can you play French horn? I'm like, why are you picking the littlest kid in the school to play the biggest instrument? I, and uh, I would lug Could've it back tuba. and forth. You know, I had to walk to school. And if you notice, my right shoulder is lower. Um, so I, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, for me, it was just music, everything, music, music. It, it's, it's where my whole brain, my mother would say, of course, if you only knew your studies as well as your music. But that's all I cared about, really. Um, but I cared about art. You know, it wasn't just music for music's sake, it was the artistic side of it. I seemed to, uh, and, you know, kind of go in that direction. Um, and I did try to become, you know, I played, I went from French horn to being the lead singer in the high school band and, you know, whatever, found guitar eventually and the Elvis Costello singing dictionary. And, uh, and um, from there, you know, just, I, you know, I wanted to get into the music business. It didn't seem that I was going to become a professional musician. I, you know, things weren't kind of going in that direction. And I, and I understood early on in being a lot of bands, I, I understood the sacrifice. And I think, when, you know, in terms of my job, and it's very, I get very close with artists, and it, it, you have to get to know them in order to do my job well. And I think, you know, what I understand is what, what a sacrifice it is. I mean, you have to, if you read Patti Smith's uh, Just Kids, uh, 
that's that book is essential reading uh, because she was the that's that's the sacrifice of becoming any kind of artist, which is letting everything else go to pursue something. Um, and uh, so uh, I started writing about music that because I enjoyed writing and. Um, and then I, through writing about music, I met a publicist. And I was like, that seems like a cool idea. And uh, I'd like to maybe get on the other side of the phone. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know there was a music industry. I know that sounds silly to say now, but I, I didn't really think about it as a business. And certainly my mother didn't encourage it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then you were writing about music, and then you had the band. Uh, um. well, yeah, I, I had, a, and then and then got into, uh, and then I, uh, I through a friend found out about uh, a job opening, and I, 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 classic story is that I gave my resume in on a Thursday, and uh, on that Friday I got laid off from this job. It was a, ma a magazine job. I was doing a lot of magazine work. Uh, the music industry was my fifth job out of college. I didn't get into it till I was 27. So um, I had already started the band. Uh, and then got into, you know, and, and I stumbled, again, it was a publicist job that was open, and I was like, fine, take it. I took a $12,000 pay cut to get into the music business, and it was the, you know, my father was not happy, but I, I it was the best move I ever made. That's amazing. And I, kept up with the band for about seven years after that. And, and the band ended up signing a, a major label deal and doing no, a lot of... No, 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 no. No, that, that was, no. <laughs> was this, I thought no. you guys... No, no, independent. We just okay. we put it out through a, a small label that was through Caroline and did okay. minimal touring because I'm... Because I'm, you had a day job. I'm weak. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good. Well, uh, we were called You and What Army. We, were, we are reviewed in the Trouser Press 90s book and you can hear us on Spotify. Yes, you can. My, my bandmate was uh, industrious and said, let's get it on there. Great. Um, so tell us about, uh, so, well, so, so then you went to work on the, pub, on the other side. Yeah. So, so and I always found this interesting, doing music, as being a music critic, you're being constantly hit up by publicists, typically for record companies, sometimes independent publicists. Hey, you know, we've got this new record coming out. You should really listen to it. You should write about it. You should tell everybody how great they are. And then you're, you're on, on the other side, telling everybody you should really write about it, to, uh, you know, yeah. tell everybody how great the band is. I mean, I, like, like from being the small-time musician that I was and understanding sort of what an artist goes through and what an artist has to do to get to a certain level, from being on the, working at magazines and being a music critic, I, understand, I understood instinctively early on what, from what the having to talk to, yeah, like. what they needed. I mean, you know, um, I have a lot of managers saying, you know, where's my... Where's my feature? And I'm like, you write 1,500 words on your band. I'm curious what it'll be. You know, so, um, you, know, so you know, I understand what an editor has to think about, you know, in terms of their readership. I'm very realistic about that. And a lot of my job is managing, the, is expect, you know, managing expectations. Not to mention the competition for the critics' time. Well, yeah. I mean, they have very little, and you know, they you know they could fill us this stage up with all the records they get in a week. Right. And uh, although now it's a lot of digital, unfortunately, but I you know, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I like to say that you know, big, when I talk to my clients, I'm like, big hassle. You know, we can take your CD from this part of the stack to this part of the stack, and that's you know, from there you're selling art. Taste is subjective. You know, good luck to all of us. And that really is the key, is if, if the critic or the people, the gatekeepers, the media people, and this includes bloggers and, and others, if they've got a stack of CDs this high, yours comes in, it's all the way at the bottom, just having the clout to be able to get it to the point where it might actually get listened to, that's a huge Absolutely. advantage. Absolutely, that's a huge advantage, but it's also a huge, it's still just the beginning, you know, they say when a band gets signed, that's when the work begins. I mean, that, you know, uh, when you are getting your, you, you know, when you tell someone to listen to your record, I, I also, I have to realize that I'm asking someone to, I'm asking a critic to listen to a record. I've now heard it 50 times, and they haven't heard it yet once, so I have to, I have to remember what, my, I'm always very careful to remember my first instinct, and my first impression, rather, of when I hear an album, because that's what I'm dealing with. You know, by the time I get to you, to the critic, you know, I have something very clear in my mind, and I'm trying to, you know, I know the quotes, I know the sentences formed, but they don't know anything yet. Now, 
in the in the last panel on on social media and converting people to customers, we were talking about being able to follow and um, tap into the fan base of other bands that are in the same musical sphere as you, like-minded. Uh, right, and so look for bands that that you think you are either emulating or that sound like you or you sound like them. But don't most musicians think that they're completely unique and they sound like nobody else? Um, yes, they, you know, and you definitely want to, you know, I always tell a, a, a musician, an artist that, you know, you can't paint your masterpiece while looking over your shoulder. You know, you have to be in that headspace. You have to think that I'm doing something completely unique. Uh, nothing coming out of my mouth or my fingers, you know, uh, in my office will ever, com you know, compare some, or will rarely compare one artist to another. I let the journalists do that. Um, so, but it's, you know, there is sort of a, you know, that R-I-Y-L, recommended if you like, you know, the related artists on Spotify, whatever. I mean, you, there, no one is completely, you know, doing something in a vacuum, or the very few are. But the critic's job, as you're saying, is to place the art into a context, which means comparing it to what's gone before in the culture, exp explain why it's either doing something innovative or something that's completely lackluster and not innovative, and showing that they have the, the background knowledge to explain why. And I think part of the, the responsibility that independent artists have is to be able to anticipate that need. People are going to want to compare you because it's the only way they can understand it. For my end, though, I have to go in with the naivete that I am selling the best record ever made. And that's, you know, I, you have to sort of pres preserve some sort of innocence in terms of, in terms of the, uh, you know, what, what in, in terms of the energy you're putting into this project. At the same time, being in the back of your head, you're realistic about where it sits in the culture and in the hi history and, you know, that not, nothing, you know, would have, everything comes in a line. The role of publicity and publicists has changed. Well, actually, I'd, I'd like you to explain. The, the media landscape has changed. Internet, social media, everybody's a critic. Um, what, from what you started out doing and continue to do today, what has remained the same and what has changed as the world has become different with digital media? Um, well, obviously, uh, the what remains the same is I'm still dealing with editors, tastemakers, writers. Um, there are just a lot more of them. Uh, but, you know, today's blog was yesterday's stapled zine. And um, you just have to be, you know, aware of all of them, which is, you know, a headache in and of itself. Yet um, exciting. I get excited by, you know, I think... I like that everybody's a critic on certain res in a certain respect. I mean, the comment section is a little maddening because um, you could have a great review and then have a comment that says this is bullshit, you know? <laughs> uh, but that's okay because everyone, you know, opinions are like belly buttons. Um, I, I, I think that's fine. Uh, but so what, what remains constant is, uh, is that uh, you're still trying, you're still, my job is to sell art to these tastemakers. Um, what makes them taste makers is sort of, that's the culture talking. You know, who's paying attention to whom. Um, uh, what has changed, though, is that I have, to, uh, I have to be aware of the very rapidly moving news cycle. Um, and I have to be aware of how easy it is to get on WordPress and create a blog. And I have to be, you know, so there, there has to be a lot of, um, uh, I'm sort of, cherry picking as well. Like, you know, I'm going to get a lot of requests for something, but, you know, a, a blog with 15 Facebook friends, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they're writing and that there's enthusiasm, but, you know, versus a, you know, versus, a, you know, something like a stereo gum or a pitchfork, you know, that's, I just have to be aware of the, of the hierarchy there, just in terms of who in the culture is paying attention to what's being written, you know, um, and so you're not going to give the same level of, of attention to a blogger that, that just started as you would, you know, the, the critic for the New York Times. Well, you know, I, I, I have always made it a personal part of my life. I, I, like, I like being nice. I think being nice is important. I think, 
I think that's what life's about. Uh, I, I don't get, I don't, I don't think that, you know, it does anybody good to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, prickly and, and I'm not better than anybody else just because I, I work with bands. You know, who cares? You know, I'm not saving lives. But I, um, or maybe I am helping in some weird way. You are today. <laughs> yeah. Say, I, I saved your life today. <laughs> no. So, um, <laughs> but uh, I lost my train of thought. But well, uh, the... Uh, well, oh, we're talking about the, the amount of relative attention between yeah. a New York Times critic right, and a Right, right, thank you. So, I, I mean, I will treat them um, nicely. You know, I'm, go I'm going to give them the time of day, but I'm obviously not going to sell my artists on doing an interview with them. I'll be ca I, I can't. You know, you know, I have to be very... I, I do think less is more, and I think you can't... I think you'll, you'll drive an artist crazy. My job is weird. The, 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 the publicist's job... Uh, Doing press is not always fun, especially in America. There's so much of it to do. You can burn out your, your client. And they get asked the same question endlessly. There is that. Especially if there's Ex something to ask about. And also, unfortunately, there's a lot of journalists who don't do their homework or, you know, and there's, you know, you have to be very careful. So um, I'm, on, I'm very realistic from certain bands, you know, need me, want me, where's my article, where, you know. But at the same, then eventually, though, they'll hit that wall and I have to monitor that. Is it true that there's no such thing as bad publicity? I hate bad publicity. I don't believe in it. I think it's terrible. So a, a negative review is not necessarily... Who something? wants a negative review? Why would right. you want that? And, oh, great, so they know it's out. So, but they know it's out and bad. Uh, I, don't, I don't like negative publicity. I don't think it's... I'd rather be ignored. Fair enough. Um, so our audience is, is primarily independent musicians who are struggling to figure out how to, to place things in the new media landscape, most likely are not in a position to be able to afford a professional publicist. They're doing their own publicity work. Um, especially in today's day and age, if you're releasing an album independently, you, you paid for it yourself, you're doing everything yourself, you have, you know, except for perhaps your bandmates or some close friends and relatives helping you out on this thing, what are the, 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 the rules for or the advice that you can give from your perspective on how independent folks can reach out and try to generate the buzz. Everybody says it's about the buzz. You got to get people talking, get, get interest. Interest leads to gigs, interest leads to sales, interest leads to the moving up on the ladder. Where do you start? Well, I, I think, you know, it's, I think usually almost 100% of the time, uh, a band, you know, will, I'll get that question from a lot of artists and I'll, I'm like, don't spend your money on me. Spend your money on a van, get in it, drive it all over the goddamn place, and play shows. Pick markets, you know, break out of an area. You know, if you, depending on where you live, pick four or five markets within driving distance and play every Monday night in that same bar and, you know, in that same town month after month after month. You know, that's, you want to generate buzz, be a band and be, be an artist and, and you know, you know, if something is not cool, me saying it's cool doesn't make it cool. So I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, it has to be actually cool. And it, so, uh, you know, I'm just a go-between. Yeah, so I have, you say that, you know, people pay, you know, their media will pay attention to what I have to s say, or they'll see if, it, if there's a big hassle label on the package, it gets over, put over there, and that one will definitely get open. That's a good thing, but at the end of the day, it's really not, I'm not gonna be able to create buzz in a vacuum. It has to, it's, it's, it's other things, I need other drivers. So I think most of the time it's like, you know, let, t I, I'm only good at telling a story. The story has to get written, has to be created first though. I'll tell it. There has to be a there story. There has to be a story and that story is said band is, is, you know, in the basement writing, you know, with blood on the page. So if, if, if I'm an independent artist and I'm putting out my first or second release that I'm doing myself and I want to get the world to know about it, I want buzz, I can call up somebody at Rolling Stone, not ever get them on the phone. They're never going to pay attention to me. How They're do pay attention to me. <laughs> um, do I 
just completely ignore mainstream media? Do I ignore newspapers? Do I ignore magazines and go strictly with the social media? Do I spend all my time in, on Facebook and Twitter? Or do I try to strike some balance of going after traditional media and, and the social stuff that I am probably doing in my spare time anyway? I, I mean, I, I'm going to say something sort of that sort of repeats what I said in the last answer, which is, again, I, I don't think it's about even paying attention to the media. I know that's crazy. I'm a strange publicist in that I don't necessarily, I think I come way later in the process. And I think today bands and fans are talking to each other at speeds unknown to man. And that's what has to get taken advantage of. You know, I'd much rather a band uh, share a song with their 500,000 strong Facebook fan page, uh, you know, fan base or, you know, Twitter uh, or, you know, any Instagram or whatever their, you know, their Tumblr, whatever it may be. I'd rather them go straight there than have some, you know, Rolling Stone be the media partner that breaks it ahead. First, you know, we do that and there's a lot of that. But in many cases, I just think the band fan thing has to be shored up and, 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 uh, that's the priority. So, and once that, and that's part of creating the story, you know, and that's, you know, the media will rarely, it happens obviously, the, but the media will rarely make the news. Normally they tell the news. But like, for instance, somewhere, somehow, the media heard about Courtney Barnett and they started talking about her. And uh, I found out about Courtney because of a, um, because of a, a journalist. There's a little bug. There's a fly in here. So Wait, can you do that Obama there's thing? And there's probably, that's actually a camera. <laughs> <laughs> the NSA that, is here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the new drone. It's actually a drone. Um, so, uh, um, social media. So social media. So that's, that to me is, tell that story. That's the story that gets created. That's the, you know, when... Courtney Barnett shows up to a town and there's all the, how did all these people know about her? Or, you know, um, I mean, does, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, now, now I'm forgetting the name of the band. Okay, I got it. Neutral Milk Hotel. Like that, that second record, which now is of mythological proportions, uh, you know, people hold it in the highest of, you know, it's like the Bible. Um, um, does, you know, how does that happen? That doesn't happen because Rolling Stone said it was there. That would happen because there's, there's, a, there's a cultural movement towards something. So it sounds like what you're saying is put in the effort on social media because that's kind of where you can directly communicate with people and there are things that you can do to get more people talking about you and sooner or later the media is kind of going to catch on because yeah. those people are actually looking and they have Twitter feeds and Facebook pages too and they get recommendations that way. I just think that... Is, is I, that more or less? Yes, more or less. And I think what you just want to... When you're involved... when You want to control as much as possible and you want to be in control. And what you can control is that. I think sometimes the media will break the story. Sometimes the media will find out about it first and turn people on. That happens all the time. Uh, obviously in the blog world, blogosphere, magazines do it a lot. But... I just don't think you can count on it. So don't think about it. Let that happen if it happens. Clap your hands, say yes, yeah, first record. That was, that was like you know, the Teletubby of records. You know what I mean? Like That just exploded. No one knew why. It just, it just struck a chord. But don't count on it that it's going to. So, so work the, hard on the controlling. The odds are so slim. The odds are very slim. So work work mostly on the stuff you can control, which is writing the best music you can write and really giving of yourself as an artist. Because the, usually the world can tell the difference between someone who wants to be an artist versus someone who has to be an artist. You know what I mean? So I think that, um, uh, I think that's the stuff when you can control, that, the stuff you can control is that, that part of it and the reaching out directly to your fan base part of it. And then the rest comes. Do you, do you yeah. think that people think that there's like an in inverse relationship? The, the more active on social media you are, the worse you are as a musician? 
that, that it's actually the, the, the ones who suck are the ones that are on Twitter the most, and the ones that are really t truly great are busy writing music and don't have time to, to deal with social music, media stuff. Interesting, you know, it, it, I, you know I'll, I'll think about that. I, I, you know, Not uh, to discourage I, people from... No, the, I think, the, I kind of look at it whether it's like, you know, one of the reasons why I'm sad about losing the CD and I'm glad vinyl's coming back, you know, is that I just look at, and, and, and I tell this to artists too, Twitter, Instagram, like, album art, band name, album titles, song titles. They're, it's all part of the creative process. It's fun places where you can get creative. And I think a good artist is smart and funny on Twitter. I work with Manchester Orchestra, you know, Andy Hull and that group. They're hilarious on, and you know, they're, that, you know I think you can be creative. Um, there's something probably to what you're saying, you know, but I, it doesn't take too much. I wouldn't say that 140 characters should take away from you know, verse, chorus, verse too often. But use the social media. Use the tools use, that are at yeah. your disposal. Yeah, I and think hope you want, that because the mainstream follows here's on. Here's the beauty of social media, and I love the f that fans and bands are talking directly. I think it's amazing because when I was growing up, man, if I could, if I could tweet Pete Townsend, holy shit. I didn't tell me about it. I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, well, used to I used to talk to my poster and ask it for advice, my Who poster. I, you know... Didn't tell me very good things, so uh, or anything. But um, I just think you know that that you know social media is wonderful, and it and it's and it's such a great place for uh, for bands to again to be creative and 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 and, and find fans. I, big part of my job actually is you know okay, there's the Rolling Stones, there's the there's of the world, Spin, you know, etc. Pitch for the magazine, not the all band. the magazine world, yeah. the the blogosphere, all that stuff is great. All that, but what you want to do is build dimension. You want to add character. You know, you don't want the faceless, nameless band. You want the three dimensional band. And part of that is, it, it, so you try to think of all these great personality driven pieces. Whether it's a a great interview on ESPN because my guys are huge sports fans or uh, or gals um, or you know whatever maybe these personality pieces, social media is a way to get out, you know, what the Kings of Leon are doing with um, Nacho Vision is amazing because I know those guys for 14 years. They're hilarious. These guys are the fucking funniest people I know. They're up there. And, but no one knows that because they think they're, you know, they're the brooding types. No, they're, they're, they're comedians. And they're, they don't take this shit as seriously as you think they do. Nacho Vision's been a great way to show that. Uh, and that's all through Instagram. So I like social media to add dimension to, you know, to these artists. So th with the, the explosion of digital media, there were the possibility of using all these new tools at your disposal, making videos, having YouTube pages, doing Instagram, and, and getting your own personality out into the world and the blogosphere exactly. in a way that you hope at some point maybe the mainstream media will catch on. I mean, you want that connection, right? I mean, you know, uh, you, you just want, as a fan, you want that connection. If you can relate to your artist that you love, that band you love, because you know that they're, you know, they know more about horror flicks than you'd ever anticipated. You know, that, that's so cool. And now it's you, rare. That's what's new today. That's really what's... Well, so you have some really, really major clients for whom pr publicity work probably means managing requests. Mm -hmm. And then you work with a lot of up-and-coming artists where it's really about trying to get the world to pay attention to these bands. Yeah. So what has social media done to your business, the publicist's job, has, has it made your life easier, harder? Do you end up having to manage banned social media platforms as well Sometimes. as the, the other stuff? There are suggestions you can make, and there is some, some of that, certainly. Um, or would you rather have a band that does their own social media and let you focus on the other stuff? I mean, I don't, I don't need to get involved in the social media, and I usually trust them. If I'm asked, you know, if I notice, hey, you know what, that voice that you're using, maybe, you know, you should switch that up, or, you know, maybe you should, you know, let's get on social media, and, you know, let's, this is how we're going to share the song. I had an artist recently say to me, like, how should I get my new album title out? I'm like, right on Twitter, just, you know, boom. Um, you know, so I think so social media is a... Uh, I, I, I don't mind monitoring, and I like being a part of it, but I don't. Th I think if I'm getting involved, if I'm getting in the middle of it, it, it brings it slightly less authentic. Like it should be the band's voice. Don't you think people can tell that if there that if there yeah. is a post from Robert Plant 
that was written by a publicist yeah. that they can tell it's actually you know not what? Robert Plant. And it's okay. Like Robert Plant, if there's some information that has to get out and it gets out that way, that's okay. You know, if there's a if the social media was never in, if that particular art of social media was never intended to be a personal platform, that's okay. Um, but it would be wrong to 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 have someone write in Robert's voice and pretend to, and be, pretend him. to be him. Hey lads, what's up? You yeah. know, like you know, that's that's not that's pretty inauthentic and see through yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do do you keep tabs on people who are now coming into the industry trying to do what you do, starting new publicity firms and and entering that space? Do you have any advice for somebody that wanted to become a publicist in 2014? Um, I you know for me yes I mean I love. I, I, I would like to actually try to hire them before they start their own company. <laughs> Are you hiring? Sure. Uh, no. Well, you, you know, You're opening depends. a New Orleans depends. office? I would love to do that. I had so much fun this weekend. There's a so tax far. credit for that. Really? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I would like to have an office in every warm city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Especially if there's a beach <laughs> exactly. nearby. Um, I, I, I... What advice if somebody would I... wanted to become a publicist mm -hmm. today, what, yeah. would you, what would be your first three things that you advise them to do? Well, I would say that when you leave at the end of the day, it's not because the job is over. It's because you've decided to leave. <laughs> I mean, you know, the job never ends. Never ends. Um, it's 24-7, especially because of phones, and um, which, you know, allow me to be here right now. You know, yesterday I was working, but I was on site, you know, at the... You know, no one knew... Uh, you know, someone on my staff has a VOIP phone number, 212 number, and he could be, you know, in Paris, but they're calling a New York phone number. You know, so that's, these kind of technologies are great, but they've also, they also changed the scope of the job where it's now you have to be available. And also response rate, you know? Well, these, you know, this, people, this is the trade-off. Yes. You, you don't have to be in the office, right. but you have to be always reachable. Exactly. So yeah. you lose a bit of your, you know, you lose your life. I mean, publicity is an intense job. It's, uh, it's, it's an all-encompassing job. Um, uh, but anyone I hire, I'm less interested in their job, in their desire to be a publicist and may, way more interested in their record collection. I want to know that they're freaky fans. I want, I want to hear how many artists they slept out for tickets for. You know, I want, I want, I want crazy passion. I want obsession. That's, that's the gig. So, and so, the advice to an aspiring publicist is really, really care about music. <laughs> if yeah, but if that's advice and you have to like think about it, then right. you know you're the, behind uh, the eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> if if you don't have that, right. then you're. I want someone record, you know, collecting since they're you know ten or you know they went right. to their first concert because their parents. Uh, uh, you know, I, actually, what's crazy is that there are people on my staff now who's I'm older than their parents. Which is very troubling, you know. That would be very troubling. My to dad me took me to Mastodon the other day. I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question for Ken Weinstein while we're here? Anybody else? Because I can go on all day. We don't have fun. all day. I'm, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> well, good. Me too. You can, you can, so yeah. This is fun. This is fun. What are you doing after? I'm uh, hopefully seeing Mardi Gras Indians in very hot costumes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to Jazz Fest. I don't yeah. know about you. <laughs> well, I didn't say I was going to be a Mardi Gras in the end. Um, yeah, ask questions. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, if you want have a question, please come use the microphone. My phone's blowing up since I'm here. I know. Hopefully it's not Robert Plant. Is it? No. How about any advice on literary works, on books? Uh, because as you've been talking about music, I'm uh, publishing a book. Mm. Just you know, certain little things that were coming to mind. Do you have any advice on, on, uh, or on it on a PR for, for books? Books, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, uh, in terms of in terms of wanting to be a publicist for books, or in terms of wanting to get public publicity for your book. Publicity for my book, yeah. Right. I mean, I, it's the kind of the same thing, right? I mean, I I think that um, you know, I, I mean, how many authors have written how many books? before, you know, they got noticed, and then, you know, wow, you have 50... I was just reading a, a story about um, this science fiction writer. Was it in the New York Times? I'm trying to think of a science fiction writer who's really famous now, but 
I don't think he got famous till his 15th book or something, and he's just so prolific, and, and he finally struck a chord with one of his books. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, the name of the game is perseverance and of any art. You know, what, I mean, Van Gogh didn't sell one painting in his entire life. You know, I mean, but he kept on painting because he had to. It was in his gut, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, um, I just think you persevere and keep on trying to find that audience. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the lesson that, that we were talking about from the mu music side still applies to a book. You utilize the social media, continue to engage with the people that are your potential readers, and, and yeah. one example that comes to mind. I mean, you can mind. go to a bookstore and start, you know, and offer a, you know, you can get creative. Go to a book, go to a local bookstore and, you know, offer to create a reader circle or create a book club or, you know, you know, and in, then, you know, wedge, as you're doing that, you know, you're collecting email addresses and you start a Facebook page and an Instagram account and, um, you know, maybe, maybe become a writer for the local media, you know, and get your name out that way. And, you know, there's little things you could do that way that'll, you know, sort of think more holistically that'll feed, you know. Well, a great example that comes to my mind in, in the literary world is a book called The Long Tail by Chris Anderson, which is about the music industry and using digital media. And so he wrote the book, he published the book, and then he had the website and the blog that went along with it, which he was continually updating with all of the latest research, all of the latest information about the topic that was in his book, which was you know published a year and a half before. But he continually positioned himself on the expert, as the expert of all things relating to that topic, so that when somebody's looking for a an after dinner speaker, he's gonna be the guy that gets that call because he's used social media and the web platform to continually update that topic. So I think that's one angle that you can uh, focus on. Building a story again, so then, you know, eventually when the story, the bigger story gets out, there's so much to talk about. All right, we've got time for one more question and I see we have one more here. So Ken, I was looking and it looks like you've diversified your business practice into getting into mu music publishing and that arena. So can you talk a little bit about what made you go from doing straight publicity, getting into more music publishing uh, revenues, and, and what that's been like for a publicity firm to kind of branch out into that arena? I, I, um, I the decision really was just, as, as you realize, and I think we're, we've been talking a lot today about how things have changed. Today, more than ever, there's so, everything is so related. Um, and uh, I saw, you know, it actually started in a, in a practical way in the sense that a friend of mine was at a publishing company and wanted to start his own sync licensing company and I funded it for two years. And as he was on board and I was learning about what he was doing, I, it seemed like a great, it, as radio got more, uh, you know, sort of, um, it got away from, you know, sort of taking chances and it was harder to get onto playlists, uh, advertising and film thinking and all of that became the way to uh to get to get to be known now you know it was it was a new publicity uh, avenue and it sort of it kind of clicked in my head that the, that there was a lot of relationship there it was kind of the new radio in a weird way so um when he was when when he was doing his company there th through my you know through my under my umbrella i came up with the idea that it would be great to start a publishing company and um, also I could meet, it was another way for me to meet new bands and I f could feed bands to the publishing company and it just, you know, obviously there was revenue ideas in mind because, you know, uh, with the, the, the wild, wild west of the modern music industry, you've got to, uh, you've got to look for those handholds and footholds to survive and um, so, uh, those thoughts came into my mind, but you know there was some artistic side, there was some commercial, and it kind of it, it just made sense. I don't want to get involved in something that doesn't make sense, you know, uh, because it's uh, you know I'm not going to be good at it. But when it makes when it all fits in, then it just you know create other services that I can offer. And we actually have a panel next weekend on that combines sync licensing and advertising, and it's talking about examples of artists like Lord and and some others who. Um, basically used getting a sync license in a television commercial as a vehicle for publicity, yeah. which then leads to album sales. I'm hoping to start work with this new uh, singer-songwriter. Her name is Odessa, and uh, she had a Subaru ad last year. 25,000, you know, YouTube video 
uh, streams you know, in a very short period of time. Now much more, but it, like it clicked off as soon as the ad ran. That like the YouTube video just went boom, uh, and you know. So all of a sudden now, as a result of that, I sort of have a base. Uh, there's, you know, you got to build the foundation before the the attic. You know, you got to build the basement first, and and I think that, you know, anyone who's kind of starts, if if you try to work up here too much and you don't have this, then you're not going to win. But when you have something like that, that's a great foundation to to begin uh, your campaign with. Um, not foolproof, but but a nice step. So that's you know that that's why it's you know they're related. Great. Well, we've got one more panel that we need to do today, so okay. we're going to wrap this Good. up. But right. How about a round of applause for Ken Weinstein Thank from you. Big Hassle Thank Media? You. Thank you so much. This was great. This is really fun. I appreciate it. Okay, don't go away. We're going to reset the stage, and we'll come back with the um, website Demolition Derby. We're going to play American Idol with websites.